We are live here at Disciple Dojo. We'll see if anybody shows up. This is our second live stream. If you are just tuning in, we did one of these to celebrate our 20,000 subscriber mark. That was a couple of weeks ago. And we had a great time. We gave away a lot of resources. And I have some more resources tonight that I'd love to give away to some viewers. But the purpose of tonight's live stream is to do open q a and so what we're asking is anybody who's watching jump on the live stream chat and ask any question you want to ask this is we call this open mat so in jujitsu martial arts training that i uh, the type of martial arts that i train and teach jujitsu has what's called open mat an open mat is where it's not a classroom there's no set curriculum people just show up and they just train whatever they want to train with whoever they want to train with it's very free for all it's very relaxed and laid back and it's a time where you get to sort of in martial arts you get to workshop things you know like oh, i've been working on this arm bar and i just can't hit it because they keep escaping you know how can i tighten it up so you grab a partner and you're like hey help me work through this help me problem solve or you know go about 50 percent against me and let me try some things so it's just a way of making each other better and uh so that's what this open mat session, this live stream is intended to do theologically, is give Dojo viewers a chance to just come and bring your questions. Um, we see some that are popping up, which is awesome. So I'm going to be getting to as many as I can, as often as I can. Um, if it doesn't get too full last time during the live stream, the comments were coming fast and it got a little hectic. But we also have our friend Gregory from Bible Hacking is here and he is helping me by running things behind the scene so gregory is going to pop in he's giving me some notes there he is our good friend our our tech sensei um gregory how you doing man i'm fantastic how are you jm i'm good i'm good we had fun last time i'm, I'm looking at the i'm gonna try to look at the camera when i talk but when i have to look at the stream here and seeing some of the questions Questions um, are pouring in already. FYI, we got questions about the second coming. We got questions on tongues. We got yeah. a purple belt in the in the chat showing off, and I love it. What's Daniel up? Louis, Daniel Louis, purple belt, BJJ, and a pastor in Vancouver. That's awesome. Hey, Daniel, put in the chat where you train in Vancouver. I'm really interested. I know a couple of people out that way. The jujitsu community is very small, but I'd be interested to know where you train at. Uh, welcome, man. Purple. Those of you who don't know jujitsu. A purple belt in jiu-jitsu is like a black belt in pretty much any other martial art. Like you got to put in time to get the purple belt. So respect to Daniel Louie here in the chat. Um, let's do, Gregory, why don't you help me by pulling up questions that you think would be good and I can just, you know, respond to those and, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Does that work? Yep, we got one. This one caught my attention because of a recent guest that you had on that also joined us on the live stream. So yes, yes. I, I think you could talk about this. You can wax poetic about this immediately. Oh, uh, we could do a whole series on this. So the question is from Homemade Theology. Uh, good to have you here, Homemade Theology. It says, hello, do you believe that scripture talks about Christ's second coming? Thank you for what you do. Well, you're welcome. Yes, I absolutely believe scripture talks about Jesus' second coming. Um, what I don't believe is that every scripture that people say are about the second coming are necessarily about the second coming. The, the big example for me personally, I don't think Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, which is in uh, Matthew and in Mark, uh, where he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man when his disciples ask him, what is when are these things going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming? I don't think that is talking about the second coming because his disciples didn't think he was going anywhere. When they asked about the coming, naturally they would have been asking, thinking about the context of Daniel 7, the coming of the Son of Man before the Ancient of Days to receive authority. I think they were asking about, hey, when are you going to basically inaugurate your reign? And Jesus takes that question and he basically lays out what's going to happen to Jerusalem that kind of completely turns all of their expectations on its head. So in that instance, I don't think scripture is talking about the second coming. And, and a lot of people go right there. 
uh, and read that into it. But I'm not a, a full preterist. I do think scripture does talk about the second coming. I think that when the Thessalonians, the passage that people think is about the rapture, I actually think that's about Jesus's return and the resurrection of believers. And um, I think Revelation obviously talks about Jesus's return around chapters 18, 19, 20. Um, so definitely believe the second coming, just, I don't take a dispensational view of many of the passages. So for more I, I, on I, I, that, I, I, if you're interested, ask, Jam. Um, go ahead, Gregory. let me, let me give a quick plug. If you're interested in more on that, like way more, yeah. Yeah. go to discipledojo.org slash podcast. Uh, it's on our website and we have an entire series called apocalypse. Now it's only audio. We don't have it on YouTube but it's uh, what the Bible teaches about the end times. And we go deep. It's 10 one hour sessions that are all about end times eschatology stuff. Greg, what were you going to say? Just super brief. Um, explain the term dispensationalism. It comes up a lot when we're talking about end times. What is yeah. it? Because I, I think it's a popularized concept that's out there that maybe a lot of people don't understand what the term actually means. Yeah, it's it's a theological way of reading the Bible that breaks up history into these uh, self-contained segments of time called dispensations. And in each dispensation, God judges humanity based on different criteria. And we are currently in the, the dispensation of grace. Uh, and then that, in this way of reading the Bible, that will end when the church is raptured out of the world and then other stuff happens, and that is where dispensationalists start to kind of splinter among themselves. Uh, Premillennial, I mean, uh, pre-wrath, post-wrath, mid-trib, post -trib, it's more than we can get into now. But if you're interested in knowing more about it, um, check out that course, Apocalypse Now, the podcast. We talk all about it, and we give a good working overview of it, and, and we don't take a really uh, hard position on either one. Uh, I just try to present the views and say, now let's read scripture in light of these competing hermeneutics and people can decide where they land. So um, we got a lot of questions jumping in. I mean, this podcast would go for hours. Um, so let me um, you talk about speaking in tongues. You want to talk about women and uh, women as pastors or biblical leaderships. Um, want to take a talk about what it meant when Jesus said, um, uh, you know, I'm forsaken or yeah. the Bible talks about Jesus being forsaken at the crucifixion. We got well, all kinds of interesting topics. So I see, um, natural G asked about what is your opinion on speaking in tongues? Um, that's the next one I'm looking at in this. I, I'm going to say up front, I don't have a strong opinion on the concept of tongues uh, glossolalia, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, my theology would be, um, charismatic friendly. Like I'm not a secessionist. I do believe the miraculous gifts of the spirit continue. Uh, I don't think you can make an argument that's biblically based that they ever cease. Uh, but, but I understand that people try to, and I get why they do. Cause you know, you look around in our experience and it seems like they've pretty much ceased, but, I, but I also know that there's a lot of nonsense that people have uh, views that people have when it comes to things like speaking in tongues. I mean, let's be honest. Most of the tongues that you see, especially if you watch Christian television, it's nonsense. It, it's not, there's nothing of the spirit. It's, it's learned behavior. It's rep, repeat, repeating sounds. Um, I mean, just because you say habala shanda on the end of something, that doesn't, that's nothing. That's gibberish. And it's not intelligible. And that's the biggest thing that scripture says tongues have to be, is they have to be intelligible if they're spoken in a setting where other people are listening. And if they're not, then I believe scripture maybe makes room for something called a prayer language where you just talk to God and commune in the spirit. And I have friends and colleagues and, and people who I deeply respect that, that talk about they have a prayer language. I've never experienced it, but I also know the Bible says don't forbid speaking in tongues and and beware of calling something of God not from God. So I don't want to do that. But at the same time, also let's let's be real. There's a lot of nonsense. Um Satan, John Wesley talked about this a lot during his ministry. John Wesley would preach and there would be like these 
miraculous things happening that were very exciting. And he would always just be like, yeah, but that's not the point. Like, you know, so-and-so appeared and they had a demon and we prayed and they left and then we continued preaching. It was just very much like in the books of Acts, these things would happen, they would deal with it, and then they'd keep going. Whereas in a lot of charismatic churches today and, and charismatic stuff online, those things that should be sideshow, if anything, become main show. And that's what I, I sympathize with my secessionist friends when they look at a lot of the nonsense and they go, this is, this is ridiculous and unbiblical. And I'm like, yeah, that probably is. But that doesn't mean that you can't jump from that to the gifts ceased and there's no such thing as tongues and, and all of that. So that's my short answer. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience with speaking in tongues personally. It's not a gift I've ever desired uh, or asked for or really wanted. I'd rather speak intelligible words uh, through the spirit. So, but if, if, but if that's somebody's ministry, as long as it builds up the body and edifies and things are done in order in a way that's intelligible, I think it's great. Um, so JSK89, hi, Jim and Gregory. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing well as well. I, I got one thing one for you. Uh, I don't know if you if we'll have the time to get into this jam. Um, okay, let me just let me just acknowledge George Coggins, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Here, uh, as a fan of The Office, I love seeing somebody from Scranton. I saw that too, and that's that awesome. probably what drew me to George's question later on, which I'm gonna put up right now for you. Okay. Um, I don't know if we can get into this. Are you are you like deeply versed in the Protestant uh, Reformation, the Reformation um, in 1885 and why supposedly books were removed from the Bible? You have thoughts on that? Why were I? I don't know of any books removed from the Bible in 1885. Um, I'm trying to think what happened in 1885. The Reformation. And no, no, the Reformation was in the 1500s. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They called this the. There's a different term for it, the Protestant Reformation or something like that. And it's when, more or less, the Deuterocanon was removed from the Old Testament. And I don't want to say it was removed, but, you know, well, it was yeah, no, I don't. That's not I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, the there was, you know, the apocryphal books continued into the old time. I mean, Martin Luther put them in his translation. Um, they continued to be in use by the Church of England. Maybe some Protestants like just decided to stop publishing them, but they were never part of Hidden. the Bible. Yeah among Protestants, but, but I'm not a historian of scripture translation. So I can't say specifically what that event is about. 1885 just doesn't ring any bells in my head about anything related to the Bible. So that might be a question that Mark Ward would be better equipped to, to field. He might have a little more background on that, but. I think I, you touched on it already, JM, where my head was at was, and I don't know that, um, the gentleman from um, Scranton, George, was referring to this, but there's this kind of pop culture thing. It lives out on the Middle Earth internet a lot that, yeah. you know, books were hidden and books were removed. And you already touched on that. That's that's what I was hoping you would have gotten. Yeah. Nothing was removed. You know, the Ethiopian um, church still uses them. They're still part of their canon. Um, the Eastern Orthodox still has most of those books in their canon. Like you can literally go to Amazon and buy a Eastern Orthodox study Bible, which you reviewed one, and they're all in there. So the idea that something was removed or hidden, um, I think yeah. is just a, is, is not is a false idea. Yeah, I'm always that should be a we'll call it that should be an orange flag. Whenever you hear someone talk about books being removed. That should always be an orange flag because, like you said, the books are in existence around the world and someone can't remove them. What they can do is say, we as a denomination are not going to recognize this set of writings as scripture, which that's, of course, just saying these are our doctrinal standards. Uh, but in terms of removing, I mean, a lot of that plays to the sort of Dan Brownization of um, our culture, you know, like just the desire to find a conspiracy and everywhere. Yeah. It's 
I just that's why I say it's an orange flag. You know, there may be a little bit of truth to a denomination saying we are no longer going to publish these books in our lectionary or something like that. But but that's a far cry from, you know, some secret cabal of old white men who control the world hiding books in a vault in the Vatican or, or you know, just all kinds of nonsense. So uh, and I'm not saying that's what the person that asked that question was saying. I just I'm just saying what I see on my social media feed all the time, <laughs> which is just bananas. Um, we let me announce this now for those. Uh, I don't I can't see. You can see how many are in the chat. I can't see. But however many, whoever in the chat, um, we have a special guest that I want to bring on for a few minutes. Um, she's going to join us and. If you don't know, I reviewed recently a number of books by our friend Lois Tverberg. And Lois and I did a whole discussion on the um, basically Rabbi Jesus, the Jewish background of Jesus and the New Testament. Lois was um, kind enough to send me copies of her book. And we tried to have her on the live stream, the first one that we did a few weeks ago, but we had some technical difficulties and we couldn't get her audio working. That has been solved, thanks to Gregory. Um, and so Lois is going to be jumping in. I'll, I'll maybe do one or two more questions. Lois is going to jump in, and she will be open to taking questions as well. So if you have any questions, especially that have to do with Rabbi Jesus, the Jewishness of Jesus, or the, the Hebraic background of the New Testament, uh, Lois may want to take a crack at some of those. So let's i'm looking back at the questions that, that here's one that was early on as well in what way do you think jesus was forsaken at his crucifixion and death okay um this is from my purple belt brother daniel that's a great question there have been whole volumes written on the cry of derelition um in fact my dad's one of his final papers when he was in seminary he had to write on the cry of derelition the jesus's cry from the cross I, I take a, a multi-level view of it. Uh, and what I mean is when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't think he was primarily making a theological, philosophical statement. I think he was screaming out Psalm 22. Like, I think that's the equivalent is the audience would have heard or, or the people watching who knew scripture would have heard the opening lines of Psalm 22. And I think he was crying that out because he was living. If you read through Psalm 22, we have a sermon on the podcast uh, where I actually talk about what was Jesus thinking on the cross. And, and it's a look at Psalm 22. I think he was invoking that Psalm as the son of David par excellence, who was experiencing to the fullest what David had only prophetically and poetically wrote about in that Psalm. And when you go back and read that psalm, read it in its context of what David would have experienced, and it's metaphorical, like like his hands and feet being pierced, or or like lions around him, or um, you know dividing his garment, things like that. Um, there's it's metaphor, like it, it's hyperbolic. David was using artistic imagery, but then when you look at Jesus, he was actually literally experiencing a lot of that stuff. And it, it, it takes on a whole new meaning, which is what Matthew has been trying to show throughout his gospel, Jesus reliving and recapitulating Israel's experience in himself. So was, was the father and the son, like, was there a rending of the Trinity on the cross? I, I hesitate to go that far. I don't know. I don't rule that out. It could be possible that something metaphysically was going on that that we'll, I mean, I'm sure something was going on that we'll never know the fullness of. But personally, when I hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I hear the title of Psalm 22 first and foremost. So reading Psalm 22, I think, gives us a better idea of what was going on on the cross than kind of later metaphysical reasoning. Uh, about the Trinity being rent asunder and, and all that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not a very committal answer, but I think when you get into that realm of theology, you have to be okay with holding things with loose hands. And, it's good. and just, you know, saying, speaking where scripture speaks and being silent where scripture is silent. 
it's what I try to do to the best of my abilities. But that is so antithetical to our culture. Our culture, you got to pick a side. Like, yeah, it you, makes for what bad you YouTube uh, exactly. click rating too. Like, it'd be much better for the algorithm if I came out with hot takes and yeah. and just you know released a dogmatic I, <laughs> declaration. I, I, I really appreciated um, how you pulled in. Um, I think you said it was Psalms twenty two. Um, because that's I see that theme recurring in Bible study a lot. Um, you see Paul doing it. Jesus does it constantly. Even in the Old Testament, you you see the authors refer back to a scripture by referencing the first part of the scripture. You know, they yeah. didn't have verses and they couldn't say turn to page two hundred and forty six or chapter three, verse seven. So they'd yeah. say the phrase, the first phrase at the top of the psalm which then drew the whole audience to, hey, let me go and see what the rest of that psalm spoke about because yeah. that's, the, that's the context that Jesus is talking about. Yeah, it's like if I were to say we're not in Kansas anymore, right. you would immediately understand uh, I'm talking about, you know, I'm, I'm alluding to the Wizard of Oz, and then you would draw a comparison, like what might I be trying to say by making that allusion? Um, I think it's very similar to what the New Testament authors do with the Old Testament. Um, there's a, I'm looking at the chat. There's some good stuff in here. One person asked, let me find it. Um, they said, how do I understand Jesus being fully human? Yep. Where, which one was that one? I saw it, but I'll now put it's it up here in a second. Robert Nobles, Robert Nobles asks, um, as a way to understand Jesus being fully God, fully human. And then I guess this is a second question. Did Jesus need faith? Yep. Um, it looks like a two-part question. I, the reason that that stuck out at me that I wanted to mention it is because the very first episode that we did of Superhero Seminary, the very first one, was the one where Silver Surfer explains the Trinity. And that, if you haven't seen that episode, um, jump on our Superhero Seminary playlist, check it out, because... I that's where I kind of, you know, in the form of Norrin Rad, the Silver Surfer, give sort of an analogy for the Trinity that I think comes the closest to uh, what's going on there. Um, the second part of this, though, did Jesus need faith? Here's where <clears throat> you I would want to know what the person what, what you mean by faith, um, faith, meaning a relationship with God. Absolutely. He needed that. Faith meaning assurance of what is unseen. Absolutely. Jesus exercised faith and walked in faith and lived in faith. Jesus wasn't an avatar. He wasn't some ghost or apparition. He wasn't like Superman walking around with his glasses and his jacket on. Um, he was fully human. Like, like the Christ hymn of Philippians, he emptied himself and became took on the form of, of a human. So everything that humanity experiences except sin, Jesus experienced. Uh, the, the, the divine kenosis, I think it's called, the divine emptying, uh, putting his, as one of my professors, I forgot which one it was back in summer, he said, um, Jesus put, he puts his omnis on hold during the incarnation. Like all of the Jesus wasn't going around doing magic of his own power. He'd specifically say, I can't do anything except what the spirit needs and what the spirit does. And, and I'm at work because my father's at work. So that's something that I think we don't give enough weight to sometimes is Jesus's humanity um, while at the same time maintaining his divinity. And that's where that Silver Surfer video, I think, is, is maybe give a helpful way for people to think about it. So... so Let's um, let's jump on. There were some more quotes about Bible translations and um, Book of Enoch and all that kind of stuff. I the person to ask these questions to would be David De Silva, our friend David De Silva. Um, if you'd missed the episode where we talked about the Apocrypha, hop on and, and check out that episode. And uh, just heads up, David De Silva is coming back. We're going to do a follow up discussion this week. We're going to film it. Uh, so he's going to be returning to the dojo, but he is my go-to on all things apocrypha related. So if you have any apocryphal questions, David De Silva is the man. Um, okay, let's bring on. Let's get Lois in here if she's ready. 
we'll chat with her for a minute. And, and then comes Lois. In interesting, you were just talking about Superman and Clark Kent, and we're we're introducing Lois. That's right. And here's Lois. I'm Superman's <laughs> girlfriend. I'm Lois. <laughs> Lois, I'm glad to hear you. I could see you last time, but I couldn't yeah, hear you. Even better. I'm even yes. with the sound on. I'm, I'm maybe not so great with the the, the <laughs> camera on, but the sound. I try try harder at sound than I sound I is like. so hard to get a hold of. That's the hardest thing I've had to learn how to do on YouTube, and I still don't really know how to do it. Um, <laughs> I just plug stuff in and unplug stuff and hope that it works eventually. Yeah. So Lois, you mm -hmm. um what are you what are you doing these days? What do you what are you working on? What's what's life like on your end? What am I working on? Um oh golly. I, I'm most of the way writing another book proposal on for a new book. Honestly, I really want to write about the Torah and yeah. about Jesus and the Torah. And Ooh. a little, I'm, I'm pushing the borders of some of my people who are only like the New Testament. And they're like, I don't like that Jewish stuff in the Old Testament and Leviticus. <laughs> and so it's like, Wow, boy, Jesus seemed to like it. Right, <laughs> so, right. He sure did. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of. At least it presses my buttons. So I thought I'd press other. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't done so much. I used to be kind of more sweet and meek, and I've gotten a little less. I've been more. I get more pushy as I get older. So I'm trying. So I think everybody who's ever met you would still classify you as very sweet. <laughs> I'm so sweet. That's right. There you we go. were. Um, I, one of the questions, I, I don't know if you were listening in, but we were just talking about uh, the mm -hmm. background and yeah. Jesus and Psalm 22 and, and yeah. ways that New Testament authors would just sort of allude to you bet. sometimes Old Testament stuff. Do you have, I'm going to ask you a question, put you on the spot here. Um, okay. I am wondering if you have like a, like a, like a go-to when, if somebody comes up and, and you never talk to them and, and, and you just mm. you start talking and they're interested and they say, so your your focus is on the Jewishness of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of where that makes a difference, like a where specific incident or a specific okay. passage that sure. kind of stands out in your mind as like an example par excellence. Okay. Uh, what would you say? I'll put you on the spot here. Okay. Well, and honestly, we did one of them. You conveniently asked me a perfect uh, uh, elevator pitch back when we did our little interview where you're yeah. talking about um, the passage where uh, Jesus says something that a lot of your new age guru types are like, uh, it says, if the eye within you, know, if your eye is the bad the, eye, the, bad, yeah. good eye, if your eye is bad, your body mm -hmm. will be full of darkness. Uh, you'll, uh, how great is the darkness? And it's like, what on earth? And people have written books about it means you should look into your inner inner right uh, find your ohm and your third eye your <laughs> third eye your third eye you you know you do your chakras or whatever and so and then you find out no actually both are idioms and you find them in the old testament you find them i was chatting on a plane ride next to this jewish lady and i said good eye she's like oh yeah well, sure of course because they still use it today right i mean it is a Jewish idiom, and it is totally not what you might think. It is about being generous with your money. Mm. The good eye, and, and that's even how they say it, is the good eye um, uh, casts his bread to many or something. Right. It, it, that's right. how it's used. It, and the bad eye, it says, do not eat the bread of the bad eye because he is always looking to, he's like counting everything you eat and begrudging you it, you know? Right, so, right. The, so it's that, an idiom for stinginess stingy or generosity. Yeah. And the coolest part is right before that passage, you have, this is in Matthew 6, 19, but right mm. before that, there it starts about, um, lay, it talks about laying up your treasures in heaven, which mm -hmm. is about money. Yeah. About, and then right after it, it says, one cannot serve two masters, you know, either mammon or God. And mm -hmm. so if you know that that one little passage is about money, the whole thing becomes one big, long, intelligible sermon. And if you don't know, you're just going, I don't know. 
And yeah. people, you can't guess that one if you don't know culture. Yeah, it seems haphazard. Like he's just sort of yeah. jumping from subject to subject. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, that was a that was a, such a good yeah. insight. I actually I pulled that clip and made it its own yeah. uh, video segment because I was like, listen, if people are not going to watch this whole hour and a half or however long we talked, mm -hmm. I want them to at least get some of these nuggets. <laughs> but, but that really, yeah, that's a that in itself is a really self-contained one because it's like by understanding, if you know context, it gives you right. new data. And it's like you've been given new Bible verses and new words from Jesus that you better go do now. <laughs> you yeah. know, and like, wow, I better go be more generous and not be a jerk and stingy and everything. So yeah, it yeah. has practical implication for sure. Yep. So yep. what do you you, you talked about yeah. maybe wanting to write something about Torah? Yeah. What 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 are some things you would want to okay. tease out or, or well, explore I'll about give Jesus you, uh, here I'll even relate it to the last podcast I don't know maybe these folks are really tuned in and they heard your last conversation with I wrote you about him and mm -hmm. why can't I think of his name right now he wrote with, about with about the Romans and how novel, oh with Nije Nije Gupta Nije Gupta yeah he's talking about how novel it was well he um he's talking about Christianity among the Romans but right. um, I actually I have a um, couple really good Jewish books by Jewish authors saying, actually, you know, it's the Torah. The, the laws of the Torah are the things that are uh, life changing. And they have and it and it's the Torah itself. And even in Jesus preaching. When he's preaching from the Torah, those are the things that when the church starts doing them, that's also very much a, and so, I mean, praise the Lord for Jesus, but actually it comes from back in the scriptures he's teaching from. It's not just him, it's his scriptures, including mm -hmm. the Torah, which I'm trying not to, it's not like I'm, I am, I should say to folks, I'm not, I am not messianic. I am not kosher keeping. I have not gone into the doing Jewishness just because of Jewishness's sake. I right. say the point of it is to become a better disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, the reason I um, honestly, it's partly a little bit of a reaction of my own of to my own Lutheran background, where mm -hmm. we were very kind of I can't touch anything in that Old Testament because I hate that God back yeah. there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But so, okay, so I'm reading the, here, I'll give you a little, just bonus right out of the, I was reading Leviticus 19, which mm -hmm. is the holiness code, okay, yeah. and uh, here, I'm going to pull it up on my thing, I love the, um, oh, just a second, um, uh, and the very first line is, you shall be holy because I am holy, you know, okay, and I love the very first thing he says, um, and I'll read it in Hebrew. I hope, I think you can do Hebrew and maybe a few people can. Let's do it. Just a second. Okay, hang on. <laughs> it's verse three. It says, Ish, Imo, Va'aviv, Tira'u. That's just that first part. Mm -hmm. That means, and I, this is, I'm being very wooden. It says, a man, his mother and his father shall fear or revere and um the holiness code to us when we read it it sounds a little random until you realize it's actually um like kind of a meditation on the ten commandments only it's pushing e each commandment higher and fuller like um of course from the ten commandments you know you shall honor your father and your mother but right. here it says it's the it's the father and mother has been reversed and it's not just to honor, but it's to revere. Mm -hmm. And it's the mother is the first one who's supposed to be revered. And the way it's said, um, we we uh, translate it, every one of you, we want to kind of neutralize that. But it's literally a man shall revere his mother mm -hmm. and his father. And to, I'm like, I'm, this is great stuff. And you know, it's a meditation on and a building on top of. If you want to, if you want to honor your father and mother, 
you know what you should do? And we're talking even to you adult men. And I'm not trying to be a feminist. I'm like, you should revere your mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your father. Um, so that's the kind of thing that when I spend a little more time looking at like, that was beautiful. Yeah. Um, um, that's, I, I go down the list, but that's the kind of thing that as soon as you start looking and scratching, you go, well, that's beautiful and brilliant. And how come we never noticed that before? Right, that's right. Thing. That's one of the things I'm working on. Well, um, when it's so. it's when Jesus was asked, what are the, two, the greatest commandment? And he, mm -hmm. he, you know, quoted the Shema, but then he jumped right to the holiness code. Yeah, and that's right. Love your neighbor as yourself is right there in Leviticus. I believe it's 19. That's right. And so yes. the it, it, when I taught through Leviticus uh, here mm -hmm. in our, uh, our video series a couple of <laughs> years ago, we yeah. spent a year teaching through Leviticus and okay. my opening thing was, guys, listen, this book was so important that when Jesus yeah. was asked, what is the most important yeah. commandment? Yeah. First, he quoted the Shema, which nobody would have batted an eye right. at because everybody right. would have agreed. And then he immediately said, and the second one is like it. Period. Yeah. And he quotes from the holiness code in Leviticus yeah. and the right. New Testament authors, they, when they talk about holiness, they talk yeah. about Leviticus. They pull from yeah. Leviticus, right. be holy. Yeah. The Lord your God is holy. Um, Leviticus yeah. is, is it's, it's, we, I, I titled that series on here on the channel, the book Christians usually skip, but should yeah. right. That was what we called it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, exactly. And what, you know, I've been writing about the, the understanding Jesus in context, but I think we need more, we need more work on understanding the Torah in context to see yeah. some of the wonderful or shattering things that Jesus was tapping into. And as um, instead of being a, rev uh, you know, a, uh, instead of a revolution against the Torah, that would be my Lutheran background. It'd be more like it's a revolution in living out the Torah to yeah. its finest, you know? So. Well, we got a comment here and I'll let you address it. Um, heaven okay. bound left a comment that said uh, Martin Luther was Old Testament professor. I don't think Lutherans yep. are against the Old Testament. No. And so well, I think I want to give you a well, chance because I know that you're not saying Lutherans no. are against the Old Testament, but you are talking about oh, a tendency. Oh, so, uh, take this I'll one. just say as a lifelong grown up Lutheran, I can tell you how little interest and love we had for the Old Testament. <laughs> I'm sorry. There was a lot of, I would say, okay, this, I'm talking to the me of, and even the Lutheran Church of 30 years ago, before before um, people started thinking a little bit more about Jesus in context, is it was more of the of, of get rid of the Hebrew Bible. Well, you know what's this, what's this, the guy um, the popular preacher who wrote the unhitched you know, thing. Um, oh, Andy Stanley. Andy yeah. Stanley, who's like, we got to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. And, and um, that's, um, I would say Lutherans felt very much like that, is that we really just, I, there was this incredible, um, and I'm pretty sure they're still going on with people as there's this incredible love for Jesus and uh, anxiety and dislike for anything about the God of his own fatherly loving mm. father in heaven. <laughs> that was what I, I grew up with. So, well, yeah. I, from the little I've looked at, you know, the little experience I've had with Lutheran resources yeah. and, and, and yeah. Lutheran friends right. and everything. And I, and I have yeah. Lutheran clergy friends. Yeah, um, sure. I, I feel like it, it's a lot of it stems from the law gospel distinction that Lutheran theology makes, even within the yeah. old Testament, yeah. they say there are passages yeah. that are law and that are gospel. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and yeah. that gospel is always yeah. like the answer to law or the, no. the remedy to law. Well, there's a and problem. So, uh -huh. so it just becomes this naturally, even if you don't say, well, we are against the old Testament, yeah. it, kind of creates a lens to read the old testament as mm -hmm. just to get us to the gospel like Pretty just much. get us to jesus Pretty much. and that's where the meat of it is and it's not yeah. just lutherans that no you know right. fall into that but i i think right. that the i think that's yeah. kind of a across the board among yeah protestants, a lot of protestants that's right but when i started reading and so it kind of blew my mind when i started reading jewish commentaries on the old testament i they started seeing things like how else can i um 
show my love for my father in heaven. If he wants me to do something odd and silly, I'll do the odd and silly thing because I'm showing my love to him. Why not? Because right. he said right. so. And and that whole idea of law versus grace, God's laws are his ways of forming us into uh, his image and being more like his son. <laughs> Just yeah. like, but it, it's our own little uh, yeah, I I get it. I know there's, I understand the gospel and grace and that's a, I love those things too. It's not like I'm trying to, yeah. So yeah. anyhow, yep. Well, that's, um, yep. That, there's a, have- there's a widespread lack of familiarity with Torah yeah, among yeah. Christians in general. Yeah. And, and, the, and it might, it's not a good word to a lot of people. And I don't really want to, when somebody tells me they're Torah observant, I'm like, oh, I don't know whether I really I'm trying to point you towards that direction because people kind of do that. And it's like, uh, no, really, no, I really yeah. kind of want to stay on Jesus. And so if anything, you're reminding me, JM, that I need to stay on Jesus and not kind of move, move people <laughs> off into a different thing, which people do. Well, and that's the irony is Jesus constantly was pointing people. I, I think yeah. he was pointing people back to the original intent of Torah. Yeah, and right. and That's pushing right. past the traditions of men yeah. that had accru- right. accrued, yeah. uh, accumulated onto Torah, yeah. that were actually undermining the intention yeah. of Torah to begin with. Totally. It, Torah Torah was always forward. Po- I mean, the word means to point to to, to, to yara, you know, right. pointing out, and and it was always pointing pointing people That's to right. God and also pointing right. to the coming answer mm-hmm. to everything you know and oh, um right. but That's yeah right. yeah yep. that, it's a good discussion um but so, i see. uh heaven bound since you mentioned lutherans yeah heaven bound if you're watching and I, you just left a <laughs> comment so um if you want we have the copy of the lutheran study bible that i gave away to another winner but that winner was in australia and shipping would have been like 60 bucks to ship it to them. Mm-hmm. So if you are in America, heaven bound, and you want a Lutheran study Bible, mm-hmm. I'm happy to send this to you. Just shoot me your mailing address um, to discipledojo at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And I'll get this to you if you want it. No pressure, but hate to see a good Lutheran resource uh, sit here on the shelf while I'm talking <laughs> to a lifelong Lutheran. So. <laughs> there you go. Um, do so, you, let's see, I'm, I'm just scanning through these real quick. Fine. There's a other, yeah, sure. Um, I saw somebody go for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you saw, well, I, I wanted to give you a chance to do one more qu- uh, question. If you saw sure. one that jumped out well, at you. Somebody had asked me about the Apocrypha and not that I'm, you, like you said, you got the Silva. That's fine. You talk to him, but I actually, my answer, you know, Apocrypha and whatever is, um, a lot of material that maybe isn't necessarily New Testament, what I consider is the conversation going on around Jesus that's really often helpful to hear the what's in the uh, air around mm-hmm. him. And so, um, like, Ben Sira is apocryphal. And, um, and uh, I wrote a, um, you know, when you, um, you quoted the love the Lord, you know, yeah, would you say that Jesus was influenced by the books of the Apocrypha? Um, there are times when they'll say something that gives you a clue on the conversation that's going on and why is Jesus being asked that and what is he responding? And um, one of the things that I had, um, well, okay, that verse that you, you know, love the na- love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. We don't actually um, read it in its it's the original context of love your neighbor as yourself. Well, um, you shall you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall actually rebuke your brother frankly, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the son of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we. You know, you just clip out that last little line and we're like, well, the rest of it isn't very nice. We just like the love. Well, um, there's part of uh, when you read other Jewish writings about this line, um, you're 
Okay, let me show you another verse just nearby. It says, um, you sh when a stranger sojourns with you in the land, um, you shall, uh, let's see, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, but you wonder, why does loving him as yourself make sense about strangers? It's not that you have to love him as a, it's, be, we're reading the Hebrew a little wrong. It means you're comparing himself, him to yourself. You were a stranger once a long time ago, and you can empathize with this guy because he's now the stranger that you must love. Or, I mean, he's the one in this bad situation. Well, if, so that's not the same as saying you must love him as much as you love yourself. You're saying yeah. you must love him because he's kind of like you. Well, um, yeah, up in that, in 1918, um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, you're in a situation where you're angry with him and you want to take vengeance and bear a grudge. And then you have to say, you know what? I'm angry with him, but I'm just like him. And I can, and so, okay, you're wondering how does this fit in? Well, Ben Sira has a discussion that is, he says, forgive your neighbor's injustice. Then when you pray, your own sins will be forgiven. Should a person nourish anger another and expect, expect healing from the Lord? Should a person refuse mercy to a man like himself, yet seek pardon for his own sins? That's, uh, this has been Sira. It's from 180 BC, but mm -hmm. you actually are hearing that love, your neighbor as yourself is actually a reference to the fact that you're a sinner and your neighbor's a sinner and you need to be merciful to him in order for God to forgive you. And mm -hmm. it's actually giving a hint at why Jesus is tying those things together. And uh, I've written articles about it. I wrote a whole chapter in my walking book about that's actually probably what's going on here. And you need to you know mean the this little, book right here. Yeah, that one. Yeah, there's a chapter. <laughs> so thanks. But you, you see, you need to sometimes apocrypha has yeah. context. And so context, I want context. Yeah. 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 The, the yeah. apocryphal books, I think that's a, that's a point worth emphasizing is you can, yeah. you can find the apocryphal books helpful and, and, and insightful and edifying, even mm -hmm. if you don't consider them inspired scripture. I mean, right. modern Jews don't consider them scripture, mm -hmm. but they, they consider mm -hmm. them yeah. historical Jewish writings that give context and background yeah. and, and insight. And I think we yep. do well to, to mm -hmm. be familiar with them. I, I wish right. I was more familiar with right. some of the apocryphal books, um, which is yep. why I have people on that help me and push me and challenge me. Great. But, uh, and I would, and I would have to also, just because it's my other special, you know, when we hear like context wise, when you hear Jesus being asked about divorce, you know, divorce for any or any, when every re reason, any reason he's yeah. talking about a, a debate that goes on among the two camps of Hillel and Shammai. And yep. Hillel is like, if a per man wants to get a divorce from his wife, just give it a divorce. If she burns the cooking, you can divorce yeah, her. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And so <laughs> um, you once, of course, you, you, you don't find those in... Um, uh, you have to look in early rabbinic literature in order mm -hmm. to see that. And that's a little bit later. And some scholars are like, no, I don't touch that. Well, <laughs> you know what? That's where you got that conversation going on. If you want to yeah. see the discussion, you have to go there. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Heavenbound just gave us an update. She said, uh, he or she, I don't know if this is a he or she. Heavenbound says, uh, I'm from Finland and I already own the Lutheran Study Bible. Well, okay. that's great. That will <laughs> save us shipping and. Uh, and you, uh, your your fellow Scandinavian, uh, yeah, or, or your skate your family Scandinavian background, right? I, me, yes, I am a hundred percent. My grandparents were born on my dad. All my grandparents from Norway, but yeah. my on my dad's side, my grandmother, grandfather were born in Norway separately. Came to America, and my grandpa proposed to my grandmother by asking him her. Uh, would you like to serve the Lord with me in Madagascar? 
And then they <laughs> went, and my dad was born in Madagascar as a missionary kid. So oh, we, wow. we're as Lutheran, as Norwegian as <laughs> you can get. So I'm not Jewish. That's just, a, yeah. if you want to know, that's my life. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's cool. It's cool seeing yep. people. It's cool seeing people from Finland watching this. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> right. So, and I know there are some really wonderful Finnish Christians that are involved that I um, have gotten to know in Israel. I have some friends there that uh, they run a ministry, the Home for Bible Translator, and they have all these yeah. volunteers from Finland coming to help them all the time. So, yeah. yeah. Ah, that's people. cool. Well, <laughs> Lois, I will um, we'll okay. let you get out of here, and yeah. but thank you so much for popping in and yeah. chatting a little bit it's good that we could connect even though yeah. you know because despite the uh, technological snafu that we had the first no time. that's fine thank you for yeah, yeah i don't yeah you've got other people you got lots of people <laughs> asking you lots of questions so you gotta get, get to it so good it's job always, always great to see you guys um check yeah. out lois's books her yeah. rabbi jesus books they're right here uh, i highly recommend them you can see them and there are links to all of her books in the episode that we did uh, a few weeks, or I guess a couple months ago with Lois here on the channel. So I'll drop that in the video description after this uh, gets posted and goes live. That's great. That's fine. Uh, take care, Great. Lois. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Lois. Thank you. Thank you. You guys. Right. All right. Uh, we got, we're going to go for a little bit longer. Um, we won't go too late. I am still a, awake. <laughs> a red eye flight he's going to be catching. But well, I'm just trying to skim through. Uh, I thought one of the comments that kind of summed up um, a lot of um, um, the last conversation about the Apocrypha. I'm surprised that so many people are interested in the Apocrypha. I thought David Rogers' comment here kind of summed it up nicely. Just like we read devotional and theological lit literature today, the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha were devotional and theological exploratory materials of the first century. I'll take yeah. that even a step further. Even if they weren't necessarily devotional or theological, they were very, like particularly like something like an Enoch, was very, very, very popular. So mm -hmm. I would almost compare it to us you know like the the comment you made earlier about we're not in, in kansas anymore yeah. that book is so popular that it's off that slang is often used and everyone that hears it immediately understands the context of where you're going for yeah. and i would suggest even if you don't think enoch is you know theological or whatever for sure if you if you want to say it's not inspired understanding it being a little bit aware of its content because it was so influential probably does have some value. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Enoch is a, is a weird one because the, like Enoch, the, the crazies gravitate to Enoch yep. and, mm -hmm. and because of that, it becomes a playground for cultists and aberrant movements, yep. which is a shame because it was a popular and, and influential writing in among first century followers of Jesus even. I mean, Jude cites or alludes to it. And I've always, I look at Enoch as the way I would say like Lord of the Rings. That's what I consider Enoch is it's, it's, there's, there's a, I don't want to say there's truth to it with a lowercase T. Uh, it is pseudepigraphical. It was not written by Enoch. It was not written by an inspired author. It was not part of the Jewish canon of scripture, but just as Paul could point to a pagan altar in Mars Hill and say, this is a touchstone to the gospel. The writers could also point to scenes from Enoch or, uh, you know, some of the other pseudepigraphical works in order to illustrate the points that they were making in their writing. So I, I just, yeah, I think it's a good, we have to avoid the all or nothing approach. Uh, when it comes to books, especially ones like Enoch, but it, the, the, I think the frustration I have is I find people fascinate, like get so fascinated by Enoch and they could not tell you what's in Hebrews or, you know, they couldn't lay out the argument of Romans, but they'll tell you all about the animal apocalypse of Enoch. And I'm just like, what? read the real things first. Then if you want to go down a rabbit trail of apocalyptic writings from the intertestamental period, great. But 
don't jump to right to that. You know, that's, but you get a lot of that, you know, a lot of the, it's that, it's that conspiracy mindset or the hidden books or, you know, just people, it's like they aren't satisfied with how they've been taught scripture. And so they think, well, there has to be something else out there. And it's not that, general. I, 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 you and I are more or less the same age. Um, so I would say it, it's gotten amplified a little bit. But even when I was younger, there was still that, hey, is there something hidden here that, you know, everyone doesn't know about? And, you know, right. people are just kind of naturally drawn to that. Uh, I don't think it's the best way to do your Bible study. Um, but like you said, yeah. make sure you grasp the scripture, you know, Hebrew. Yeah, Hebrews, it's a Genesis. curiosity factor and, right. and there's nothing exactly. wrong with it. But uh, it, it's like you don't you don't eat your dessert before you eat your meal. <laughs> like, eat your vegetables first. Then if you want to have some creme brulee, Do it. dig into that. Exactly. Um, I saw on the chat, uh, R. McCaslin said, I'm Lutheran and would appreciate the Bible. Um, R. McCaslin, if you have a U.S. postal shipping address, email me, discipledojo at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to, to ship this to you. Um, because like I said, the original winner was not able to claim it. There was another question I wanted to, uh, answer because it was a good one. They said, um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, uh, I just lost it. <laughs> it asked me about. My oh, there it is. Digum one one seven. Yep, I was looking at that. I was like, I'm sure he's going to ask that one. Yeah, that one. yeah, yeah. What is your Cliff Notes version of how you study a Bible passage? You have a phenomenal video on that. <clears throat> there's, there's, man, there's a lot to say. So Cliff Notes version. Um, if I'm going to study a passage, first I have to know the book that the passage is in. So if it's a book I'm less familiar with, then I'm going to, I'm going to read through the book like all the way, um, or at least get a working knowledge of if it's a big book like Jeremiah, I'm not going to sit down and read through all of Jeremiah, but, but I will read the section at least that the passage is in so that I have the context. Of, okay. This is what's going on at the time. Then what I'll do, I, I, because I have uh, ability to work with the languages, I will always look at if it's Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament. Uh, if it's a passage in the Hebrew Bible, I will look at the Hebrew passage. I'll tra I'll I'll do a, a rough thumbnail translation uh, just so I can see how I, I want to know what words are being used in the text because they may be important and that importance may not come out necessarily in English. And then I'll compare it to the Septuagint. I'll say, how did the Septuagint translate this Hebrew passage? Now, if it's New Testament, it's a lot easier. I don't even have to do the Hebrew. I just write to the Greek New Testament. But I'll do that, and I'll look for those key words or key concepts that may jump out. And then once I can state what the passage is saying, like in my own words, I can say this is what it's saying. Then I'll start to do some digging. So if there's a if there's a word, I'm like, why did they use this verb for you know to describe this? This is not the typical verb for whatever. Then I'll get a lexicon and I'll do a word study, not a super deep one, but I'll kind of say, okay, how is this word used elsewhere in scripture? And I'll 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 do the the contextual ring. So like if it's a passage in Romans, I'll say, okay, how does Romans use the the word? And then I'll say, okay, now let's jump out to Paul's writings in general. How does Paul use this word in his other writings? Then how does the New Testament authors other than Paul use this word? Then how is this word used in the Old Testament translation of the Bible? And then I'll jump back to now in the Greco-Roman world, is there somewhere else? So that's sort of how you do a word study. You're just getting a semantic range. And then you go back to your passage and you're like, okay, now what insight does that bring? And sometimes it brings a lot and sometimes it doesn't really bring anything. It's just like, oh, they just use this word because that's a convenient way to say it. Um, and then when I've done those things, and this is all sort of at the same time I'm doing all this, I'll pull up commentaries on that passage. 
So I'll grab a commentary. You know, if I'm doing something and I just said Romans, so we'll stick with Romans. I'm going to read. I have a Romans commentaries are right here on my shelf. I'm going to grab five or six of those and pull them down uh, from Romans commentators who I know and who I want to know what they think about this passage. And that usually then becomes a game of follow the references. You know, if they reference another commentary, uh, I'll try to grab that one and look at it. Um, if there's a journal article that's mentioned that seems significant, I'll try to track that down. But it's just a case of that. You, you just decide how far you want to dig. And and it's more if you're writing something on a passage than if you're just going to do a YouTube video or lead a Sunday school class or lead a small group session or preach a sermon. There's just going to be different levels of depth. So that's just my thumbnail. That's that's kind of how I do it. Um, and then I just see what other people have said about it. At, at the end, I go to like other like I'll look through study Bibles. Um, you know, I'll look through more popular level sources if if somebody's written on it. But that's that's the process. It's not glamorous. There's nothing super secretive. Uh, I do have a video that is um and it might be the one that you were mentioning greg but but it's how to do it digitally is that the one you're talking about yep yeah yeah, so, exactly. yeah so the video and we can drop a link in the show notes um it's it's my what i it's how i study a book rather than a passage and it's a it's just an easy way you just literally all you need is an internet connection and a word processing document microsoft word or open source whatever and you just drop the text into it and then you do the formatting yourself, it forces you to have to think about the text in ways that you haven't before. Another thing, and this is, I just tried this. Um, I just taught on the book of Ecclesiastes, like all the way through chapter by chapter uh, for a group of pastors. And this is the first time I had done this, but I took um, a notebook, like just a handwriting notebook. And I sat down after I, I translated Ecclesiastes and, and had studied it and, and commentaries and all that kind of stuff. And I sat down and I said, okay, how do I paraphrase this book? And I did that in my notebook. I just paraphrased Ecclesiastes. So I didn't repeat it. I didn't write it out. I just, I just literally rephrased it in my own understanding so that I could trace the flow of thought in the book because it's a very difficult book and to, to follow along. And it was one of the most helpful things that I've ever done um, in terms of teaching a book. So I highly, highly, highly recommend doing that. Grab a notebook, sit down and just take it like, like I, I just put verse one uh, or verse one through four or verse five through seven. Like I would just kind of take these little chunks and I would just paraphrase what that section was saying so that I could follow the flow. It was, it was one of the most useful things I think I've ever done in 20 years of teaching the Bible. And I don't know why I waited that long to do it. <laughs> I, I got a very interesting one for you here. This is per, I, I'm going to pick this one because it's personal to me. Um, okay. Although I didn't ask the question, but I would love to hear your insight on that. Thanks for all you do from Travis Wilson. My question is advice for those looking into seminary as well, and this is the part that is key, as well as tips to thrive while you're enrolled. And I had mm. added on to that, not just thrive, but how about just survive while you're enrolled? <laughs> That's gonna depend in large part on where you're enrolled <laughs> and the and the, the, the level of rigor, because not all seminaries are created equal. Um, and, and it's also gonna depend on what your goals are. I, I've been out of seminary for 20 years, um, 18 years technically, and I, I just, I'll, I'll say this: um, the main thing I think seminary does, and the main use that I think it has, and this is just me personally, and I'm not a pastor. Um, I, I have an MDiv, and I could have gone the route of pastor, but but I very clearly. Uh, felt from God, that's not the route he wanted me to go. I'm the son of a pastor. I was raised by a pastor. I know what that life is like. Um, the most important thing seminary does, I think, is give you the ability to use the languages. I, I To this day, I think that a seminary that doesn't give you the ability to engage with the Greek and the Hebrew text of Scripture is committing theological malpractice. 
I, I really honestly think that because your whole, if you're going to seminary, you are going to be a spiritual leader. And, and that, that means you are going to, I'm not talking about if you're going to a counseling degree. Okay. I should clarify. There's a seminary that has a degree in counseling um, or maybe like church history or something. That gets a little, I'm talking about a degree in a field that's going to involve you teaching other people the Bible in any capacity. To not have functionality in the languages is doing a disservice to your calling. So any seminary you go to, I think, should give you at minimum the ability to decipher Greek, Hebrew, and possibly Aramaic. If it doesn't do that, I, I think you're wasting your money, honestly, because it's so expensive. And anything else that you learn there, you can get by just auditing lectures or reading textbooks. Um, but that that proficiency in the language, again, this is completely subjective. And it's my own personal opinion. But looking back, that's the one thing more than anything else that has stayed, that, that had the most impact on me and that has stayed with me for nearly 20 years is, is being able to move within the languages of the biblical text. Um, so I think that should be the, the a, a huge factor in, in when you're looking at seminary, do they require the languages? If they don't, again, I think it's an orange flag. I'm not saying you can't go there and get a good degree and get a good job and be a successful pastor. God forbid you don't need the languages to do that, but, you give God so much more to work with when you have it. Um, so that's my biggest, that's my biggest advice, how to thrive while you're doing it. That <laughs> uh, don't be married and have a family. That makes it a little easier. <laughs> that's all I can speak to. Uh, Gregory, you could answer that one because you're juggling those full-time work, family uh, and seminary. So what did, what would you add to that? Because you, I, I can't even relate to your situation in that. Regard. Pray a lot. Um, I, I, from a from a from a, a husband with kids in the house, et cetera. And my kids are you know 14, 15, 16, so like they require lots of attention still. Um, key thing is going to be do it in deliberation with your partner. So before I signed up, my wife and I had a talk. Are you okay with this? This is what it's going to take. Um, this how many years is, I'm going to be doing this. Um, yeah. Make sure and have that conversation because it absolutely will be impactful on your personal life. Like there ain't no yeah. question about it. There are countless nights where I was sitting outside uh, literally until three, four o'clock in the morning, finishing up a paper because I had to do a review with one of my mentor professors the following morning at nine, like yeah. multiple times. There's many times I had to, you know, go and sequester myself, literally, sweetie, kids, I'm going to be here in the office for, and this is my office, that's why you see a lot of books and stuff in the background. Mm. Um, I'm going to be here in the office for the next three days, literally, bring my food here, this is what I'm going to be doing, I got to get this knocked out. Um, so yeah, make sure and do it in deliberation with whoever yeah. you're doing life with. Absolutely. I think if you're, if your spouse, if you are called to seminary, your spouse is called to seminary. And if your spouse is not called to seminary, you are not called to seminary. Like the spouse relationship, the husband wife relationship takes priority. That's why Paul said it's there's sometimes it's better to not be married because you frees you up to do more ministry. And I think that's a, a, a key example. Um, it's got to be a team effort. And I say that my, my parent, I mean, I was, I was brought into, well, not brought into the, I was conceived in a seminary setting. I was born shortly after they moved back from seminary, but um, my parents were seminary couple. My brother-in-law and sister were a seminary couple. My cousin were a seminary couple, all of us at Gordon Conwell. Um, and so I, I've seen, even if you're not the one studying, you are still called to that life to some degree. And, uh, and it's going to take its toll. So yeah, that's great advice. Great advice. Um, Gregor, let's do a couple more and then, and then call it a night. What do you say? Absolutely. I like this one. Um, yes, I was just going to say, Richard just had a great question. Um, what three books do you recommend for hermeneutics if you have not went to seminary yet? And I, I'm going to correct your grammar. If you have not gone to seminary yet, come on, Richard. 
Uh, I'm just messing with you. First, uh, define hermeneutics for those in the, the online that don't know what the heck hermeneutics means. Yes, hermeneutics is the fancy way, and it's a it's an unnecessary way. But people that pay for degrees, they have to sound intelligent, and that's what academia is. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying Bible study method. How do you study the hermeneutics? Your hermeneutic is how you approach the Bible. So if you approach the Bible and read it literally, like everything is literal, then you have a literalist hermeneutic. That means when you come to a metaphorical passage, you're going to misread it. Likewise, if you read the Bible where everything is spiritual and allegorical and symbolic, you have an allegorical hermeneutic. When you read historical parts of the Bible, you're going to misread it. So hermeneutic is just a way of saying, how do you interpret the Bible? Um, I'll, he asked for three. So off the top of my head, let me, let me grab three that I would recommend. You, you would have three right by your hand there. I love that. Yeah. Love it. I love it. I love it. That's why when I saw the question, I was like, I'm certain, like, I, I don't know, but I, I would bet money that Jam has three books right by hand that he could pull and say, here's three great books for hermeneutics. Um, yeah. Right and, and these are literally just three of many, but, but they were right behind me. Um, the first one, I always recommend how to read the Bible for all it's worth. Uh, Doug Stewart, my former professor, and Gordon Fee. This this is the book uh, for how to interpret the Bible. Um, I recommend this one more than any other book because it's the most accessible. It's, this is not the current edition. Um, this is the third edition. I think they're on a fourth or maybe a fifth edition by now. There is just you, you have to have read this book. Um, it's just phenomenal teaches you how to do the nitty gritty walk through a Bible passage, approach different genres, different types of writing in scripture, how to choose a translation. I mean, just everything. This would be my first choice. My second choice would be grasping God's word. This is by J. Scott Duvall and J. Daniel Hayes. I'll get it so you can see the glare. Um, this also might be a newer edition, but this is a, this is a, textbook. I mean, it's thick, but it literally walks you through um, how to, the, the image they use, let me see if I can find the picture. Um, they use this image. I don't know if our camera will show it or not. They use this image of a contextual bridge. So when you're trapped, like the biblical text is the world of the Bible, and there's a river that we have to cross. And that river is culture, language, time, and situation. So we, we live in a different culture, language, time, and situation than the biblical text. So when you're interpreting scripture, your job is going across that river into the world of the text, finding what you find there, and then bringing it back across the river into your modern text. And they have a whole, I mean, this is just at the beginning, but they have whole chapters that outline the process of how to do that, how to cross what they call the principalizing bridge. Like you, the example I use is when Paul says, don't muzzle an ox while it treads the grain. He's, he's pulling from an Old Testament agrarian law in order to get the principle of that law and then bring it into his context, which was first century Corinth, in addressing an issue about paying people who minister. So, so Paul does a beautiful example of that, and um, grasping God's word is is anybody could read it. It's written to not for technical scholars or seminarians. The last one that I would recommend is my friend Ben Witherington, his book, The Living Word of God. Um, I, I've debated between this and N.T. Wright's book, The Last Word. I, I think it's kind of a toss up, but I appreciated. Um, Ben's book, I think I appreciate it a little bit more. This is a theology of the Bible. In other words, what is scripture? What is the Bible theologically? How do we approach it? How do we interpret it? Uh, how do we read it? How do we study it? How does it transform us? So these would be my three. I think if you had these three, uh, you've got a pretty good not a substitute for a seminary course, but you've got a big chunk of it. 
in these three. So those would be my recommendations. And I would give them away, but I use these. So <laughs> I can't have them. Uh, all right, let's mm, – one or two more. What you, what you think, Greg? Um, here. This is a comp <coughs> complex one, but since we were talking about, you know, things that you should hold with a more open hand, I think right. – there's some good balance and 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 talk touching on the Trinity a little bit. This Someone I know loves Jesus. Matthew Benavides asked this, but cannot confidently say that they believe in the Trinity. They understand that God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, but don't put affirmation of the Trinity itself. Probably one of the things they 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 may come across is the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. Yep, so yep. you know, therefore, yep. why are we even making a fuss about it? Thoughts. Yeah. This is a great question, and I want to I'm going to be very careful in how I answer this because this this requires nuance. No one for centuries of the early church believed the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity came later as a doctrine with that terminology. And now don't hear what I'm not saying. Every believer, in the early church would have affirmed the deity of Christ, the oneness of Jesus with the father, the deity of the Holy spirit. They would have affirmed those things, but the language that they would have used to lay it out, that was foreign to the, the, the later language of the Trinity that was foreign to many of them. So when people get hung up on the doctrine of the Trinity, I always start to say, okay, why do you not believe it? Tell me what you don't believe, because a lot of times what people don't believe is not actually what the Trinity doctrine itself teaches. What they end up, what you find out talking to them is, oh, they just don't believe in polytheism. Well, great. You know, they, they don't believe in modalism. Great. You know, like the Trinity is such a, it, it, there are no analogies because it is, if, if the Trinity is true, there can be no analogies to it because it's the very nature of God. And there can be no analogy to the nature of God that is not ultimately heretical if you press it for literalism. So what I say to people is, do you believe that Jesus is to be worshipped? If they say yes, okay. Do you believe that, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall have no other gods before him. Only Yahweh can be worshipped. Do you believe that? If they say yes, great. Can you hold those two things together? That only Yahweh can be worshipped and that we worship Jesus. And Jesus forgives sins and Jesus was given the name above all names, which is the name Yahweh. Um, do you believe these things about Jesus that the New Testament teaches? If so, and you're just hung up on this later doctrine called the Trinity because you think it's a little too Greco-Roman, philosophical, I don't have a problem with that. I, I think assent to the doctrine of the Trinity is not the same as confessing Jesus as Lord, as God incarnate. Um, so it's a very nuanced answer. I'm not dodging the question. What I'm trying to do is reframe how we think about it. And again, the superhero seminary video I mentioned at the beginning of this live stream, if you haven't seen it, the silver surfer episode, that's where we actually unpack this a little bit more and give an analogy from physics that, that helps us understand how to approach the problem without answering all the questions. So awesome. hope that helps. There was one I saw. There were some that I can do these pretty quick. Uh, one says, uh, hi, JM, what's the best commentary for the book of Leviticus? I saw that. Um, yeah, Jansen, Bernie, Ryan, um, Simat Tupang. I think that's how you say your name. I'm guessing this is Indonesian or somewhere in Southeast Asia. He was on the uh, live. He was on the live stream as well. I remember. Or the, sorry, that person was on the live stream as well. I remember yes. that name. It is a easy to remember name. Yes, it sound. It sounds Indonesian. I'm just taking a guess. I could be completely wrong. Uh, best commentary on Leviticus. I I will recommend two. Um, the, the standard is um, Jacob Milgram. Jacob Milgram's Anchor Bible Dictionary commentary on Leviticus is the gold standard. Now it's also worth or costs about as much as a bar of gold. <laughs> it's three massive volumes in the anchor Bible dictionary. So it's not cheap. Um, he wrote a short, there's a condensed version that Milgram wrote 
it's not as good. The one in Anchor has the full discussion. The condensed version, I don't think it's as helpful. It's better than nothing, but it's not that great. Now, Milgram is not a believer. He, he's a he's a Jewish scholar, so he's not a Christian, um, and and he's a critical scholar. He does not hold to you know Mosaic authorship of Leviticus, but he's unmatched in terms of the symbolism and the the purity concepts and all of those things. So you have to know Milgram if you're going to study Leviticus. But then in terms of popular commentaries, like more recent ones, our friend Jay Sklar, Jay's Leviticus commentary, it's in the Zondervan exegetical um, commentary series. Check out our interview, our episode that we did here with Jay about Leviticus. He has a popular level commentary in the Tyndale series, and then he has a scholarly one in the Zondervan. And that's the new one that just came out. It's wonderful. So those would be, um, off the top of my head, those would be my two Leviticus commentary recommendations without a doubt. Got to know Milgram. Um, Sklar is doing great work and it's accessible. The third one, I'll just throw this out as a bonus. It's not a commentary, but the work of Mary Douglas. She's an anthropologist, not a biblical scholar, but she wrote on, she wrote a book called Leviticus as Literature. And it's phenomenal. I don't agree with everything in it, um, and, and and she's been taken to task by biblical scholars on some of the things. But regardless, it's one of those like books that moves the needle. Mary Douglas, Leviticus as literature, definitely worth reading if you're interested in Leviticus. Um, okay, quick questions that we can fire off. Uh, Mo Ortiz, did Paul teach a rapture in First Thessalonians? No, he did not. He taught an uh, apontesis. He taught uh, that we would be harpazo, that we would be caught up in the apontesis. If you want to know what that means, check out the video here on the channel. We have two. We have one where boring old me teaches it, looking at the biblical text on the screen. And then we have one where Son Goku from Dragon Ball Z teaches it in our superhero seminary series. Uh, but no, Paul did not teach what is commonly thought of as the rapture. He taught the second coming and the resurrection of the dead and the going to meet our returning king in his, in the air because he's not returning from a foreign country. He's returning from being seated at the right hand of God the Father to welcome him into his kingdom forever. Um, all that, the other charts and dispensational stuff. I that scripture, say. that first Thessalonians in the rapture is cool. cut, handled really, 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 really well at an easy to understand level by a really highly respected scholar that you've had here on the channel. Uh, it's really covered well. It's a part of a chapter. So it's probably five pages long in Matt Halstead's um, The End of the World as You Know It. Yep. Yep, Matt has a great discussion on that entry level, gets you right yeah. into it. Easy um, to understand. Yes. And we also look at it in the podcast here, Apocalypse Now on the Disciple Dojo podcast. Um, we look at that in a, one of the sessions is on um, Paul and the end times. And so we jump on that as well. Probably uh, the most meta important question for the day. Metabolicolic. <laughs> Metabol Am I saying that right? Metabolicolic. <laughs> Jam, are you going to write a book one day? Um, I've written four books, actually. <laughs> two ebooks, so those don't really count, and then two paperbacks. Uh, the first paperback book I ever wrote, it's called um, Cleansed and Abiding, A Proposed View of Christian Perfection. And that's where I took basically the four views of sanctification and holiness that kind of float around in theology and tried to synthesize them into what I think is a fifth, a uh, view that pulls the strengths of all of them with the weaknesses of none. Don't know if I succeeded or not. I probably didn't. Probably seven people know about that book. Um, <laughs> and then I've written another book, a uh, paperback called You Want to Be Left Behind. And it's just a collection of like 10 essay chapters on different things having to do with end times. Um, all of those are available on Amazon. You can just find me on Amazon. But will I write a real book, like a non-self-published book? <laughs> I hate writing. Uh, this is a little known fact. I, I, I don't like to write. I don't script anything. Uh, the, the only thing we do at Disciple Dojo that's scripted are the superhero seminary videos. And those are like pulling teeth. Um, so if I, 
the, I don't have anything that I think I could contribute in a book, honestly. I think that my contribution in the world is as a popularizer, as a discusser, as a uh, explainer, at just, just that kind of thing. I don't think it's as an author. So unless God tells me otherwise, um, I have no plans on writing a book anytime soon. Respectfully, I think you're wrong, but that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, you know, now if if somebody wants to take uh, AI and call my teachings and turn them into a book, then I would be happy to chat with them about that. And speaking of, Gregory, oh. let's close it out. You've got something that you... Uh, showed me that I thought was pretty awesome, but I want you to explain it to the viewers who are here. Yeah. I, I so I made a tool, which I'm going to show you the screen of it right now. While you're doing that real quick, there was a question. I want to answer this. It's from the Cripe crew. It says, I'm coming out of a reformed church and getting back to my UMC Wesleyan roots. What are some other good YouTube channels that approach scripture from an Armenian viewpoint? Check out Seedbed. Check out Seven Minute Seminary, which is yeah. either done by Asbury or done by Seedbed. And uh, check out my friend Matt O'Reilly. I think his, his channel is The Theology Project. Um, those are good, solid resources. Uh, I would check those guys out. Okay, Gregory. Um, good, great question, Cripe Crew. Some of the names are amazing, though. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I, as a, as a this 30 second concept yeah. here, as a, a, someone who grew up in church, I, I, I spent a long parts of my life sitting in church services and church teachings. And I had always liked to take notes. Being a nerd, I used to literally, like up until months ago, walk into church with a laptop. And I while my pastor's preaching on Sunday morning, I'm there literally pounding through notes. I got logos windows open and I'm cross-referencing, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So I built a tool that uses AI to... Long, long and the short of it is transcribe any talking. And I actually, I'm going to give away for free, 100% free, just ask for the link. I'll, as a matter of fact, we'll put the link where you can download it in the, 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 the description of the video once, it, you know, once we post the video after the fact. Mm. Um, this is JM's interview with Nijay. It dropped on Sunday. was about an hour and 45 minutes. My app took his interview, the audio of it, you know, the, the two of them talking, and it summarized it. Obviously, it's using AI. Summarized it, and let me get my mouse over here. There. And in addition to summarizing it, pulls up things like, what are the main points? So it literally listened to JM and Nijay speak and summarized it. Here are the main points of what he spoke about. Let's say you want to find out, um, you know, some of the uh, references. These are the things that Nijay and JM spoke about while speaking about, you know, in that interview. Nigel Spivey's work, Carmen Ives and, Gr and Richard, that's Imes, and Richard Middleton, ancient sorcery in the Christian prayer. Like, you can literally see it. In addition to that, there's also arguments, you know, uh, opposite of it. And then the nice one that I like is obviously also the full transcript. Welcome to Disciple Dojo. We had a great discussion here today with my friend, Dr. Nijay, and it's literally every single word of the transcript. So in addition to this transcript, it's broken it down into arguments, references, stories that, you know, they spoke about, um, follow up. Um, like if Nijay said, you know, one of the things you should probably do is go and follow up on so-and-so-and-so um, there. So if this seems value to you, the link to download it for free will be there. If this is something that you could use yourself, it is an app I built that'll take literally any audio. I use it when I go into work meetings. I use it at church. I use it when I'm in lectures for school. I literally just take my phone, put my phone down, turn on the app, record all the audio, give it to the, the, the app, and you know, in 30 seconds, you get this type of results. That entire document, was generated in under a minute and no human hands touched it. <laughs> All of this was literally just created by AI. The app costs 20 bucks or something like that. And there's a free seven. And when I say free, it's not one of those jacked up um, free where we take your money and then you got to try to get it back. It's completely free. If you go sign up today, it's free. 
no charge at all on your credit card or anything. Use it, try it, test it. If you like it, keep it. If you don't, cancel it. Um, but I thought, you know, the audience here who's into Bible studies and stuff and, you know, into, you know, sitting in meetings and hearing people talk and you want to get, get deeper study of it, I thought you'd find that interesting. It's actdescribe.ai. Actdescribe. That's awesome. That is that is incredibly powerful technology. Um I can I can see so many uses for, especially for people like you said that love podcasts um, or the JSK and I. I wish I had something like this back in lecture days of college. Yeah, me too. Like having a transcript of all of Sean McDonough's Revelation uh, course lectures would be mind boggling. With, with bullet points. With yeah, actual- yeah, yeah. He said while he was speaking, I use it in meetings too. Like tomorrow I'm flying out to go and talk to a customer. So I'm going to sit in their office for two hours and we're going to have a conversation. What do you solve? How do I fix this? Blah, blah, blah. And when I walk out of the meeting, I will get those notes transcribed with every promise I made the customer. I told him I'll send them the invoice next week. I'll send them an estimate two weeks from now. I promised I'd send a plumber over to fix his toilet. All of those things will be listed off there so I can act on them because I found in my professional life, you either can sit in a meeting and take notes or you can sit in the meeting and be engaged. It's mm. an either or. I mm. have to be engaged, but the notes would be valuable to me as well. That's why I built this app. Yeah, that's phenomenal, man. Viewers, this is why he's the Bible hacker. This is uh this is this is you you hear all about the doom and gloom scenarios of AI. We're uh we're we're looking at some of the good uses for it um that are gonna have yeah, I could see this being revolutionary. So I will Disciple Dojo is happy to uh endorse and to help disseminate this app. So folks go to the link uh just dropped in the chat below, check it out, and uh yeah, very, very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Hope you guys like it. Um, Like I said, it's designed to be easy to use. You could do this with chat GPT or something like that. um, If you're a techie, Um, I designed this so my 80 something year old mom out in the Caribbean can use this. And she uses this right now. It's literally three clicks and boom, you get this thing generated and in your inbox. So that's, it's easy to use. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if something like this is involved you may see a book by me at some point (laughs) where where i don't have to sit down and actually write then yeah but (laughs) oh man benjamin i'm glad to see you're trying to quit smoking i will definitely pray for you i'll pray right now god give benjamin the ability to quit smoking give him the willpower the desire and the conviction to drop this disgusting habit in Jesus name. You can do it, Benjamin. Awesome. That's awesome. If that's not what the Christian life and community is all about, brother jumps into the chat, says, pray for me. Like five people already prayed for him. You prayed for him live. That's, that's what, that's what it's about, man. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also Benjamin, let me give you a tip on how to quit smoking. Start jujitsu, take a jujitsu class. You will get smashed and your lungs will be on fire and you'll realize, oh, I got to stop smoking so I can come and beat these people. But I've seen so many of the students train with us stop smoking for that reason. So hopefully you can do it. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to I think we're going to call it a night, man. This has been a good live chat. Folks, if you appreciated this, uh, share this link like once it's on the YouTube channel. Share this link with others and tell people about it. Um, I don't know when we'll do another one of these. I mean, maybe in a couple of weeks or so, but it, it just depends on Gregory's schedule, my schedule. But I, these are fun. I love chatting and, and I want to continue doing this. So if you want to see more open mats at Disciple Dojo, then let us know and, and get other people to let us know as well. Um, w- when there's a demand for something or when there's an appreciation for something, then obviously that makes us want to do more of it so gregory thank you so much you got to get to bed because you got a flight coming up pretty early so i wish you godspeed and um yeah man i appreciate all your help and all your support over the years this was amazing keep doing what you're doing jm i think you're doing the lord's work here and i mean that very very genuinely looking forward to when you write that book 
Well, <laughs> everything but the last sentence, I can say ditto. <laughs> Uh, all right, brother. Well, we will call it a night. Viewers, thanks for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, subscribe. Uh, be sure to let people know about Disciple Dojo. Our goal for the year, we set a crazy goal, but our goal is 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Uh, we're coming up on, I think, 23,000, somewhere in there. Um, so keep getting the word out, and we'll keep producing it. We've got new videos coming this week. Uh, just reviewed N.T. Wright's new children's Bible storybook. Check that out. I got a new video in the series. We started on books that every Christian should read or books that shaped my theology. Um, a new one of those is coming out, I think, tomorrow. And then we've got, yeah, got David De Silva coming back. Um, Going to be interviewing some other people in the coming weeks. So you guys keep watching, keep responding, and, and I'll keep doing it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Greg. Take care. Talk Great to you later. Y'all. All right. Bye.